Aloha, everybody. Uh, just so uh, you uh, know where I'm from here, I got got my Hawaii hat, my baseball cap, so I'll put that on and wear it through the talk here. Thanks, Paul. I was uh, want to talk today a little bit about a passion of mine, and that is uh, um, hot spots and paleomagnetism. And the research that I'm going to talk about, I really started back when I was a graduate student. It was uh, part of my PhD dissertation. Uh, and since there are a number of different uh, sort of background angles here, periodically I'll stop and I'll give you some background. Uh, hopefully it won't get too tedious. And when I start running out of time at the end, I may have to rush through it a bit. But anyway, uh, next slide, please. Uh, one thing I just wanted to say is that uh, the whole issue of hotspots has been a really fun one to me because I really thought I knew all about it. And over the last few years, uh, the whole issue of hotspots and how they behave, mantle plumes has been under a lot of question. And I think it's a really wonderful thing because it's allowed me to go back and re-examine something that I really uh, uh, care deeply about. And so this uh, quote is, is, I think, a good one. It's, a, it's, it's good to uh, challenge our preconceived notions uh, all the time. So next slide, please. Okay, I got to keep up with you here. I'm not getting my next slide. There we go. Okay, so there's a Hawaiian emperor chain. And so what the heck is that thing? All right, I thought I knew what it was. Uh, when I was in grad school and uh, when I started teaching my first classes, it was pretty simple. That was a record of the drift of the Pacific plate over a hotspot now located at Hawaii. And that bend labeled HEB there, the Hawaiian Emperor Bend, was clearly a change in plate motion. And as I'm going to tell you about with some of my research here, I'm not sure that that's true anymore. And uh, to me, that's a really big change. It changes quite a bit the way we thought about the Pacific Ocean and the way, and the way it formed. Uh, it also has really um, important implications for plate tectonics, which is what's the subject of your course, of course. Okay. All right. So... The hotspot hypothesis. I think everybody thinks they know what we're talking about. Next slide. Okay. Um, generally, we think of the hotspot hypothesis in several different ways. First of all, there's the mantle plume hypothesis, which is that a hotspot is a, is a column of magma that rises from deep in the earth, perhaps at the core mantle boundary. Uh, another idea is the kinematic hotspot hypothesis, and that is that the plumes may be more or less fixed in the mantle convection so that they form a reference frame. Uh, and in, we've all been taught that the uh, Hawaiian hotspot, for example, has stayed more or less at the same point. And as the Pacific plate drifted over it, it formed a series of islands and, uh, and seamounts that formed the Hawaiian emperor chain. And so this idea that the uh, hotspots are a reference frame has been around and been quite useful for a long time. Next slide. Uh, going way back a little bit of history here, J. Tuzo Wilson is sort of one of the first people to come up with the idea. He said that he thought that uh, mantle plumes came from the centers of st the stagnant centers of uh, convection cells in the mantle, not from the core mantle boundary necessarily uh, itself. At that time in 1963, there wasn't even an acceptance of the uh, general age progression in the, in the Hawaiian chain that had been noted by J.D. Dana in the 19th century. However, pretty quickly with the advent of plate tectonics, uh, one of the uh, uh, sort of greats of plate tectonics, Jagan, Jason Morgan, who uh, outlined a lot of the kinematics of plate tectonics, came up with the idea in a 1971-1972 paper that the Hawaiian emperor chain, which you see there in the middle of the plot, and the uh, Tuamotu line chain and the Austral Marshall Gilbert chains all had similar shapes, and that was because the Pacific plate had drifted over a set of hot spots that were more or less fixed in the mantle. And so this idea quickly took hold along with plate tectonics. <clears throat> it probably helped a lot that Morgan was the guy who uh, put it forward. And uh, pretty soon there were a lot of other models. Okay, but before I do that, let me step back just a second. Since you guys are advanced plate tectonic class, I'm sure you've talked about plate rotations before. So let me remind you of Euler's theorem, which basically says that the motion of points on a sphere can be described as a rotation around an axis through the center of the sphere. In other words, that's a mathematical uh, description. And if we have a latitude, a longitude, and, a ro and the rotation angle of that axis, we can describe the motion. Okay, 
And so one of the ways that we can describe plate motion is relative to the hot spots. If we think as in the upper left diagram here, that hot spots are relatively fixed in the mantle, the plates move over the top of them, then we ought to form island chains that, as you see down in the lower right diagram, that the Euler pole that describes the plate motion relative to the mantle should also describe the, uh, the, the, the island chain or the seamount chain should be a small circle. And that's where a lot of these plate motion models come from relative to the hotspots. Okay, so back to hotspots. So in the early 80s, uh, in the 70s and 80s, hotspot models proliferated. Here's one uh, by uh, Bob Duncan for uh, Africa, and you can see about a half a dozen hotspots in their trails. Uh, and Africa is very important because it's a linchpin in many hotspot models because Africa has a number of hotspots and many uh, other plates can be backtracked over to Africa and thereby inherit the hotspot reference frame. And so Africa is really the center of the Indo-Atlantic uh, hotspot reference frame. Next slide. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, you should be on Morgan's. Yeah. Okay. Morgan's Atlantic hotspot model. Okay, so Jason Morgan's uh, Atlantic hotspot model is very similar. You can see here a whole uh, constellations of hotspots with tails coming out of them. They look like swimming tadpoles. And they're, they're the hotspot trails coming out on either side of the Atlantic as the continents have separated going in either direction on the either side. So next slide. And of course, the Pacific Ocean uh, has the prominent Hawaiian emperor chain and a number of other chains, as uh, Morgan uh, had pointed out. And here's a mid-80s model uh, by Duncan and Clegg that shows a number of hotspot models. And one of the things that this model shows is that it shows uh, not only the Hawaiian emperor chain, but pre-emperor chains trying to be tied into it. So an effort to try to get all of the Pacific motion uh, with time uh, since the sort of late, uh, late Jurassic. Now, one interesting aspect of this model is that it suggests that the Pacific plate drifted more or less east-west, as you see on the old end of these chains. It moved rapidly uh, north-south uh, during the period of the emperor chain, and then it moved more, more to the eastward during the period that the Hawaiian uh, uh, chain formed. Next slide. Uh, so Hawaii has always been at the very center of this, and it's the arch archetypical hotspot because it's so well dated and it's so well defined. If there was ever a mantle plume, a hotspot, Hawaii is probably it. Okay, and now your your professor, your illustrious professor, has recently come up with, and his colleagues have come up with a new model uh, showing the Pacific relative motion with respect to the hotspots. Uh, and I'll just go over it briefly. Perhaps he's already talked about it with you. Uh, but it's very similar, although there are a couple of interesting differences in that he has tried to uh, build the model from total rotations rather than from stage rotations, where you would fit the Hawaiian emperor, the Hawaiian chain, for example, and then have a break and fit the emperor chain with another pole of rotation. This one uh, is total rotations with a variable number of seamounts. Uh, and then, so that's a, that's a big leap over other models, which has these assumptions of break ages and break points in, in the chains. Your lower right diagram shows the series of rotation poles that describes the Pacific motion, but mainly you see the same thing. In the center there, you see the Pacific, uh, the, the Hawaiian chain and the emperor chain. You see the very same thing in the uh, Louisville chain, which is down at the very bottom. And then you see other similar uh, chains that are potentially tied in. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then this is an age model. One of the, one of the good things about that approach is that Paul was able to uh, tie ages in much more efficiently because you're looking at the, all of the ages and not just segments of uh, seamounts where they're, where they're ages. And so here you see an age model and you see that there's, uh, with a calculated opening angle versus observed age, there's a fairly nice uh, fit here. Next slide. So anyway, we have a very nice new model for that represents the Pacific plate motion over the hotspots. And that I'll go back to that when I talk about my own reference frame, which is paleomagnetism. So anyway, back to the history. Uh, now I see you're on the right side. So the hotspot hypothesis was, uh, was all fine and good for about 25 or 30 years. And then a bunch of things happened that cast in a whole new light. Next slide. I know you've already had a talk by John Tarduno. And he was one of a number of people who recognized that the emperor chain paleolatitudes uh, 
aren't at the same paleo latitude that the Hawaiian chain is today. Uh, in fact, uh, Site 40 or 33, which is sort of in the middle of your diagram here from Suiko, that was recognized in 1980. But because a number of things were sort of coming together at this time, that leg 197 results came out, which is in the early, about 2003 here, uh, it seemed to uh, make this even more significant. And what you see is that at Detroit Geo, at the very far northern end of the emperor chain, the offset is something like 13 degrees, plus or minus quite a bit. And as you come down to the Hawaiian Emperor Bend around Site 1206 here, your offset has disappeared and it almost looks more or less linear. So as I say here in the red, holy Moses, this doesn't look at all fixed. In fact, as we'll, uh, as we'll get on to see, this suggests that uh, really much of the motion of the Emperor chain uh, could be because of this paleo latitude change. So what does that mean? Well, we'll come back to that. So next slide. Okay. All right. Uh, another idea that came along was that if you if you take the drift of the plates relative to the Indo-Atlantic hotspots and you reconstruct them and then you bring that through a plate circuit of uh, rotations over to the Pacific, you don't the two don't match up. You see here in this diagram uh, the Hawaiian Emperor chain, which you recognize, but then the the dots the dots with the circles, those are predicted positions of the hotspot. If, uh, if you take the Indo-Atlantic hotspot frame and track it all the way around. So you see the oldest here is, is uh, A31, which is about 68 million years, which is about midway up the emperor chain. But the significant thing that you see here is that you don't see this Hawaiian emperor bend. Okay, and many have taken this as proof that there's large inner hotspot motion. In other words, the Pacific hotspots may be doing one thing, and the Atlantic hotspots may be doing another thing. So next slide. Okay. My computer's not advanced. Okay, there we go. Uh, at the same time, uh, Steinberger and others were making models of the flow of the mantle. Given what we know from mantle tomography and assume, making some assumptions about density, what should the mantle be doing in terms of, uh, of moving? And we'll, what we find is that the mantle should be moving around. Of course, no one really knows what it's doing, so this is just a, a model. I have to keep reminding people. It's a model, but it's had a very powerful influence. And one of the things that it shows, as in this cross-section here, is that plumes ought not to be straight up and down. They ought to, they ought to be bent. In other words, they ought to be flowing with the mantle uh, that's moving around them. And the amount of flow depends on assumptions about mantle viscosity uh, and, uh, and other things. Uh, but this has had a very powerful influence because now all of a sudden people are expecting the hot spots to be moving around. So you have all of these things coming together, models of hot spot motion, some evidence that of paleo latitude difference, some um, uh, hot spots that don't reconstruct to one another. And so now I would say that the idea is more <clears throat> more along the lines that hot spots ought to be moving around. Uh, next slide. Another thing that's been happened is for a while, every time someone saw a number of hot spots all in a chain or a number of seamounts in a chain with an age progression, they said, aha, another hot spot. But suddenly there were many hot spots and some catalogs had 40 or, or even as many as 100 hot spots. And I think it became... Uh, became pretty obvious that you couldn't have that many hotspots that come from the core mantle boundary. So a few years back, uh, the idea came along. Uh, this uh, diagram is from a paper by Vincent Cordio and some others, that maybe there are different families of hotspots, that perhaps only a small number of primary hotspots, maybe like six, and you see those in this diagram as the ones with the long, thin sort of uh, tails that go all the way down the core mantle boundary, and you see Hawaii is one, and Louisville is one, and Afar is one, and Reunion's one. Then there's another class of hotspots that may arise from the mid-mantle over top of large areas of upwelling. You see that in the sort of blobs beneath the Pacific and beneath Africa. And then there may be another third class of uh, hotspots that are just, uh, that are upper mantle, uh, have their roots in the upper mantle. So there may be a whole series of different types of, uh, of hotspots. Well, that certainly has a lot of implications for that reference frame. Uh, which ones can you really, uh, really count on? So next slide. And uh, another issue about hotspots has been that 
we would like to be able to see them using mantle tomography, but they've been very elusive. One problem, of course, is that mantle tomography doesn't really have good resolution in the lower mantle, so we might not expect to see them. But it's sort of been one of those in the eyes of the beholder. In the top diagrams here, you see some cross sections through the Iceland plume, and you can see a red zone that's, uh, that's low velocity beneath Iceland, but it only goes to the, through the upper mantle. And so some people have taken this as evidence that uh, hotspots are only in the upper mantle. The lower diagram is one from another publication with a different color scale. And there you see not only slow in the upper mantle, but also in the lower mantle as well. So there's been a lot of argument about this. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the, the jury is still out about, about what does tomography say about, uh, about uh, mantle plumes. Some people say they see them, some people say they don't. Next slide. Okay, and then there's a whole group of people who want to throw out hotspots entirely. That's probably a, a bit of a fringe group, but uh, they've made us stop and think about what hotspots really mean. And there's been a couple of conferences, really. Probably your library has two GSA volumes that have papers from these conferences down the lower right. Uh, one is the uh, after the plume hypothesis, which was in, in Iceland uh, about five years ago. Another one was in Scotland uh, three or four years ago. And the, the, the diagram you see there is one from a plume point of view on the left-hand side and from a plate point of view on the right-hand side. And the idea of the plate people is that you don't need deep hot spots. You just have mantle heterogeneity. And when you get cracks in your plates, it causes uh, volcanism. Um, I personally think that's a little bit on the uh, a little bit of fringe, but um, like I said, we have to throw out our preconceptions uh, regularly. Next slide. Okay, so back to the Pacific and and my research. So the Pacific is a great place to look at hotspots because there is a whole bunch of island chains that may or may not have been formed by hotspots, uh, and. Uh, so if you can get a paleomagnetic reference frame to go with that, and that's my area of research, uh, we have a way of, uh, of comparing. So paleomagnetism, as I'm going to explain, is an independent reference frame that gives us a way to look at plate motion. And so if we look at plate motion relative to paleomagnetism and plate motion relative to the hotspots, maybe we can tell something about, uh, about those reference frames and about what's going on. So next slide. Okay, a little bit about paleomagnetism. You probably learned this in your uh, first geophysics course, but essentially we use the shape of the magnetic field to tell where we are on the Earth. At low latitudes, the dip of the magnetic field is low, as you see by the uh, little box around the equator. Uh, at the north and south poles, the dip of the magnetic field is almost vertical. And so we can relate that dip of the magnetic field to, uh, to latitude. Uh, next slide. Now today the magnetic dipole axis doesn't align with the North Pole, as you see on the left-hand diagram, but if we average over time on the order of 10 to 100,000 years, the, Earth's, um, the, the bar magnet at the center of the Earth acts like a, a bar magnet that's lined up along a spin axis. We call that the GAD hypothesis, or geocentric axial dipole. And so from that we can relate inclination, which is the angle I you see in the center diagram, to the latitude, which is the angle lambda you see there in the center diagram. And that's because that dip of the magnetic field changes in a regular way, like you see on those arrows that are pointing either out of the Earth or into the Earth in that center diagram. Okay, now we also can measure the horizontal component of the magnetic field. Unfortunately, as we'll find out, that turns out to be difficult in the ocean. So next slide. Okay. So in paleomagnetism, we calculate something called a paleomagnetic pole. The paleomagnetic pole is supposed to be the position of the spin axis. We assume, because of the geocentric axial dipole hypothesis, that using the inclination, in other words, the dip, and the declination, the azimuth of the magnetization, that we can tell where the north pole or the south pole, the, the geomagnetic axis was at uh, some time in the past. And with plate tectonics, as the plates move, so do those magnetic poles. As you see in the lower right diagram is a cartoon from Cox and Hart. And you can imagine that the poles attached to the plate by a long rod so that as you move, as you move the, uh, the plate across the Earth's surface, it also moves the paleomagnetic pole. Essentially, 
the Euler pole that describes plate motion also describes the, the polar motion as well. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to come back to that uh, quite a bit. Next slide. <coughs> okay. Paleomagnetists often cre create what's called a paleomagnetic apparent polar wander path. It's called apparent polar wander because the major part of the polar movement is caused by plate motion. And so we collect paleomagnetic data of similar age and we calculate the average pole position and we get a time series through time that shows the motion of the pole. In your left hand diagram you see the North American apparent polar wander path and you see if you look closely you see NP that's uh, the present North Pole and you see the ages 45, 60, 80, 115, 135 getting older as you go away then there's a change in in polar motion out to 155, 170, another change at 215 and it's generally thought that these changes are caused by reorganizations in plate motion. So you get Euler motion, Euler pole motion that's, that's consistent for a while. You get a change and you get into another set of Euler poles. Uh, on the right is a global composite apparent polar wander path uh, by Bess and Cordio where they took all the paleomagnetic data from all the continents and rotated it back to Africa and created a synthetic uh, polar wander path. Uh, and that... One of the things that that does is it gives a lot more data that can be combined. So anyway, the apparent polar wander path is that apparent motion of the pole. Next slide. Okay. All right. From oceanic plates, we have a real special challenge because here in North America, if I want to get a North American uh, pole, all I have to do is identify a, an outcrop somewhere, take a car or a Jeep, drive up to it, and take some oriented samples and go back to the lab. Well, as you might have guessed, you can't do that in the ocean. You're, the water gets in the way. So the Pacific plate is covered with water and we can't get oriented samples. So typically Pacific paleomag data have come from four different sources. And I'm going to go through those each briefly. From magnetic anomalies from seamounts, from the asymmetry of ma marine magnetic lineations, the one caused by seafloor spreading, from igneous rock cores, from drilling, uh, mostly basalt, and from sediment cores. Now, each of those four different techniques has its own problems. Uh, next slide. Okay, seamount magnetic anomalies. This is one of the things that I did my dissertation on. We had lots of data from seamounts in the Pacific where we had a nice magnetic anomaly. <coughs> Pardon. On your left, you see the magnetic anomaly on the top and the bathymetry on the bottom of a seamount that's near Hawaii. This is one we surveyed back in 1980 on the Kanakioki and it's called Palmakua Seamount. And you see, if you look at the magnetic anomaly, you see closed contours that form sort of a dipole. Up at the north, there's a closed contour. Down at the south, there's a closed contour. And you see there's positive, are the red contours, negative are the blue dash contours. You see the cross section over on the right, and you see a positive and negative anomaly. And essentially what we do is we take the bathymetry, and a bathymetry profile is down on the lower uh, right, and we calculate the, the magnetization, uh, and that's the big red arrow, the magnetization that, mo that gives a magnetic field that most closely approximates the magnetic anomaly. And if you look at the little arrows above the, the bathymetric profile, you see the blue arrow pointing down, that's the magnetic field of the Earth, and then the red arrows are the magnetic field of the seamount, and you can see those change as you go across the seamount. And you see sometimes the two are pointed at opposite directions and so they subtract and other times there's a component where they point in the same direction and so they add. So sometimes you get a negative anomaly, sometimes you get a positive anomaly and the distribution of that negative and positive changes with the shape of the magnetic anomaly. So from this seamount it's possible to get a paleomagnetic pole. Some of the problems are that we have to assume that the magnetization is homogeneous and if you've ever been to a volcano and taken magnetic samples it's not truly homogeneous. And also, all paleomagnetists, when they take samples, they take them back to the laboratory and they do some magnetic scrubbing to take away uh, overprint magnetizations that can be confusing. But you obviously can't do that when you're dealing with the seamount at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, next slide. Okay, we can also learn about the magnetic uh, paleo latitude from looking at the shape of magnetic profiles over uh, magnetic anomalies. So, this at the top is a diagram showing some observed magnetic anomalies from the Pacific and you see the magnetic wiggle. And if we phase shift the anomalies, it's the same as if we see them at different latitudes. 
And so what we do is we look for the phase shift that will make the anomalies look most like a sine wave or a square wave. And you can see at the bottom on the right hand side on the phase shifted profiles, you see the one anomaly that's in the middle has a nice sort of box car shape to it. And so that phase shift is related to paleo latitude. So if we determine the optimal phase shift, we can determine a paleo latitude. And what we get is a diagram like in the lower right, where the L is the magnetic lineation from which it was calculated. And the dashed line is a half great circle along which the paleomagnetic pole must lie that would give us the right, uh, the right phase shift. Unfortunately, we can't tell the direction of the pole. We can't tell its azimuth. We can only tell the paleo latitude. <clears throat> but if you get enough of these things from different areas, you can combine those data to try to get, try to figure out where the paleomagnetic pole is. Next slide. Okay, we can go to ocean drilling and we can take cores. And this diagram here shows a drill site. This hap drill site happens to be on Meiji Gyo, the Northern Emperors, and that's shown by the red dot. And we can take the the uh, core and we can determine the inclination of the magnetic field and determine the paleo latitude, which gives us the distance from the site to the paleomagnetic pole. But unfortunately, because the, because the drill string rotates, we can't tell the azimuth of the magnetic pole. So we can't tell what direction it lies, only how far away we are. So that paleomagnetic paleo latitude gives us a circle upon which the paleomagnetic pole must lie. As you see here, it's a circle in the center of this diagram. The blue band is the, is the area of uncertainty, the 95% confidence limits. Again, what we can do is if we get a whole bunch of different uh, paleo latitudes, we can combine them. And if they're in different places, we can look for the crossing of these paleo latitude or paleo co-latitude circles and to try to figure out where, um, uh, where the paleo magnetic pole is. Now, there's a couple of problems with this. Uh, one is that uh, from basalts, we always have the problem that we need to average the magnetic field. But typically, when we drill basalts, we don't have many uh, flow units. And so we may not, have, um, may not have enough flow units to average magnetic uh, uh, secular variation. In sediments, there is a, a problem called uh, inclination error that occurs when you have compaction that the magnetic vector may be flattened a little bit. So we always have to be careful about that. So each and every one of these techniques has its own uh, potential problems that we have to watch out for. Um, okay, so on to the next slide. Did I thought I heard something coming from the background. Did anyone have a question or anything, Paul? Okay, everyone's asleep. All right, I'll keep going. Okay, um, now on to the Pacific Apparent Polar Wander Path. It's been a long time developing the Pacific Apparent Polar Wander Path because uh, of sparse data, the problem of gathering paleomagnetic data from an oceanic plate. The polar, the polar wander path you see on the right-hand diagram here was put out in 1984 by Alan Cox and Richard Gordon. It's primarily from uh, basalt data from the Pacific Plate from DSDP days and a few seamount poles. And they basically didn't have many poles. They just defined a swath. And they noticed they have this inverse or backwards J where the, the polar wander path goes down, turns around, then it comes back up again. Okay, and so we're going to see that happening uh, over and over again. Now, it turns out this use of seamount data has waned a little bit, but not before this. Next slide. So my own uh, work as a, as a graduate student was in looking at seamount paleomagnetic poles, combining them with other data, and I calculated a parent polar wander path back in the late 80s. On the left-hand side, you see a diagram for one particular pole, a 76 million year uh, pole, and you see four seamount paleomagnetic poles, which are the, the um, stars, and you see a couple of these co-latitude arcs, and the mean pole position is the dot, and it's uncertainty, 95% uncertainty is the uh, gray oval, uh, gray ellipse around that. And then on the right-hand side, you see the polar wander path that is defined by different poles of different ages that I calculated. You see this inverse J, backwards J uh, sort of shape. You see a couple things like notice the 76 and the 66 poles overlap. There's a big gap with 82. There's a relatively almost a right angle bend there. And we'll later see some of those details will change, although the overall uh, 
shape will be more or less the same thing. Next slide. Okay, we still don't know the Jurassic early Cretaceous polar wander path very well at all because there are almost no data of that age. For my polar wander path and my in the way I've been looking at it, I pretty much ignore the Jurassic. And when I, I think that there is evidence for southward motion, and what you see in this diagram are two polar wander paths calculated from magnetic lineation phase shifts, that skewness, by Roger Larson and me uh, a number of years ago. And depending on whether you put in a factor that's called anomalous skewness, which is basically a fudge factor that's poorly understood, you get two different paths as shown by the two different red arrows. One path goes almost sort of down the 330 meridian. Another one comes from over in North America. They all end up at about the same point, which is down uh, off of uh, Labrador in the central North Atlantic. They both suggest that the polar wander path comes down from the north and then stops and it's going to turn around and go back to the north again. But we really don't know that very well at all. Next slide. Okay. Now, recently, I've been involved in a couple of studies of the Pacific and Parapolar Wander Path. Uh, one is a study that I did and published in, 19, in 2006 that was based almost solely on basalt cores from ODP and DSDP. And I didn't use um, sediments because of concern about inclination error. It should have been a much bigger study to study that, but I just didn't have the funding to do it. Uh, but I'd still needed to use seamounts and using the declinations of seamounts, and I'll try to remember to explain that in a moment. And then one of my students, Melissa Beeman, uh, and I and some colleagues published another paper looking at the late Cretaceous and more recent. We mainly used uh, data from sediment cores. We used more extensive core data. We had less numbers of other, of other data. And I'm going to go through a number of those examples and sort of explain that. I may end up having to skip through it relatively quickly to save time. Next slide. Okay, so let me go through this diagram a little bit because you're going to see a lot of other diagrams that are similar. So what we're doing here is looking at data of a given age bracket and calculating the, the mean pole. And the mean pole, the average pole, is shown by the red circle or the open, the white circle with the red line around it. The error, the confidence limits, the 95% confidence limits, are shown by the sort of flying saucer there, the, red, the pink ellipse. And the component data are shown by the arcs of different, uh, uh, of different, uh, with different numbers. Now, if you look at, these are all of age around 120, 125 million years ago. And if you look at the left-hand diagram, you see there are different colors here. For example, the blue labeled 866 is basalt data from site 866. The red dashed 581 is basalt data from site 581, but it's from the crust. The blue is from seamounts. I wanted to see if there was any difference between seamounts and, and, uh, and oceanic crust. And I don't, there are no sediments here, so they're all basalts. Now, one of the things you might notice is that all those cores that are, that are labeled with numbers all go more or less east-west. And so what that means is we don't have much discrimination in the east-west uh, position of the paleomagnetic pole. No, very, it's very poor azimuth control. So the way I got around that was using the magnetic declination from seamount paleomagnetic poles because that shouldn't be affected as badly as the inclination would. And so the declination are shown by the, the orange arcs that are coming almost north-south. And so they are constraining the azimuth. And you see one labeled DAC, uh, that's Daikakuji seamount, and the others are other seamount names. And you can see they all cross in that area near where the... Uh, the uh, uh, the 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 bright the the dot is, and I think that the black dot is one that's calculated the average paleomagnetic pole. If I didn't use the seamount declinations, and I did that just to make sure that I wasn't fooling myself with uh, seamount da data. Now, a really interesting thing that happens here is over on the right-hand diagram that I've been ignoring so far, are data from Ontong Java Plateau. All the Ontong Java data give paleo latitudes that are about 10 degrees less or 10 degrees closer to the equator than those from the rest of the Pacific plate. And I don't know what the heck that is. <coughs> it's uh, currently a mystery. Next slide, I think I have something about that. Uh, Ontong Java shown in blue here. All the other sites are shown in, in, in the red circles. 
what that data suggests is that Ong Tong Java somehow has 15 degrees less northward drift than the rest of the Pacific plate, as if somehow Ong Tong Java sat still and the rest of the plate moved up uh, uh, along some sort of transform boundary. And I don't know, I don't think there is any really good evidence for that, uh, but that's what the Pacific paleomagnetic data say. I don't know what to say about that. Uh, let's just forget about it for right now. We have other fish to fry. Next slide. Here's two more Cretaceous poles. I just wanted to show you to see some of the other data. Here's one on your left for 113 million years uh, average. Uh, and then on the right, there's one for about 94 million years average. We'll see those. The data sort of come and go in the, in the terms of the quantity of data that we have and the consistency of the data. But these are, again, mostly from basalts. Next slide. Okay, when we get into the Cenozoic, it's a little different story because we have many, many more sediment uh, cores that we can look at. So my student and I looked at a lot of Cenozoic data, and this is uh, a pole from the Oligocene, and you see a number of different things. Here, the blue arcs are from, uh, are from sediment cores. The red arcs are from basalt cores, and we wanted to we want to double check to make sure they both give the same answer, and in fact, they do. The little red star in there is the average of the basalt cores, and the little blue uh, symbol, little blue square, is the average of ODP sediment cores. We also have piston cores here. The little red dot is the average of the piston cores, and so all of those are within experimental error of one another. You can see that the the 95% uh, confidence circles overlap. Now, one good thing here is that notice that the circles, many of these collatitude circles overlap obliquely. That means that we get good azimuth control without having to worry about declinations from seamounts. We also have good agreement among the different types of data, which lends us to believe that they're probably, they're all telling us the same thing and that none of those problems with the different types of data are biasing. Next slide. So here's one from the late Eocene. You see less data. You also see that the angles that they meet at isn't, aren't quite as good. We had to resort to using uh, some declinations from seamounts. You see those as the, the vertical arcs that, that are going up, up and down there. But you still see the little different arcs. They are in pretty good agreement. The basalt core pole is pretty far to the east, but there are only a few basalt cores. They're mainly that, that declination is mainly controlled by that one, that one paleo latitudes labeled 1224. We still have pretty good agreement. They still are all hanging together sort of in the same spot, so that's good. Next slide. Uh, these are two that go back to the latest Cretaceous and Paleocene. Again, we have a number of data. We're from a more restricted area of the Pacific now because the Pacific is getting smaller as we go back in age. So there's more uncertainty east-west because of the way these paleo latitude arcs are intersecting. But anyway, you see two more poles and notice that they're about in the same sort of area. Uh, as the other ones, and I'm going to skip over the details. I know you can't look at them at all the details just to go get on to the punchline. So next slide. All right, so here's the new parent polar wander path for the Pacific Plate compiled from all those different data types that we were talking about. Let me go over it briefly. So you still see this inverse J shape, and the, the green circles labeled 145 and 139 are from the the magnetic lineation skewness, and they suggest that the that the path goes south. And then you see your red stars are the most recent poles. You see 123 at the south, go a little bit farther north at 112, a little bit farther north at 94. Then there's a big jump up to 80. 80 is lost in a cluster up there. And then the pole sort of stops. You've got 80, 68, 61, 49. Then it moves off 39, 30, and then it has to be up at the North Pole uh, today. So let's look at, try to look at what that means. Okay, this is a little cartoon. I don't have a lot of time to go over it, but uh, so it's in your, uh, sorry, next slide. It's in your um, PowerPoint when you, if you wanna look back at it. On the right ha left hand side, we have an Euler pole that shows the plate, which is the gray box moving southward, moving southward towards the equator and the paleomagnetic poles also move southward towards the equator because that, that rotation pole causes them to move the same way. And there's a mistake there. The pole should be labeled 6, 7, 8, just like the positions uh, P, P6 through P8 of the, of the pole. Now we go to another Euler pole that causes the plate to go in the opposite direction, go northward, 
And so we go in the center diagram from P5 to P0 going from going forward in time. Now the paleomagnetic poles go the opposite direction. And so that's how we get that, uh, that inverse J shape. First, the plate is going south to make the southward directed part of the uh, polar path. And then the plate goes north and that makes the northward directed path part of the polar wander path. <clears throat> and you'll also remember that was that part where the paleomagnetic poles didn't move. How do you get that? The way you get that is in the right-hand diagram is when the uh, paleomagnetic pole and the Euler pole are coincident. In other words, the Euler pole is at the spin axis. Then the rotation doesn't move the uh, paleomagnetic pole at all. Next slide. Okay. So let me jump over this. Anyway, there are different periods of, of the polar wander path that uh, show different things happening. Southward movement is A. Nor slow northward movement is B in this diagram. Uh, rapid movement is C. A still stand, no movement is D. E is the beginning of mo motion off to the northeast, and then F is a change in motion up to the present pole. So I think that we can relate that to what's going on with the Pacific Plate at this time, okay? So let's go way back to the Cretaceous in your upper diagram. This is what we think was happening with the Pacific Plate. Sorry, I keep forgetting to say change of slides. You're keeping up with me. You're on the right one. Top diagram. There's Pacific Plate out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean surrounded by the Farallon, Izanagi, and Phoenix Plates. The Pacific Plate is probably not connected to any subduction zone, so it's probably not going to move fast and it may not move in a consistent direction. And we don't know how long this went on, but surely in the, surely in the early part of our polar wander path, this should be what we're seeing. In the middle diagram, at some point along the line, Pacific Plate has to get plugged in to the Western Pacific subduction zones. And then because it's still bounded on the north and the east and the south by, uh, by other plates, it should go more to the west than anything else. And then we get down to 50 million years, okay? Now we're at the sort of in the late, in the early Cenozoic, and the Pacific Plate is starting to take on its present sort of uh, shape, and we should be plugged into the subduction zone all along the western edge. We have a Farallon Plate, which is going to disappear, and we have a Kula Plate uh, to the north that will dis eventually disappear. And so what I think has been happening is that segments A and B, where you have the slow sort of drift and turnaround, probably happened during this period uh, at the top where the Pacific Plate was not yet connected. The later part of the, of the polar wander path from the still stand onward was probably uh, uh, characterized by this lower diagram where the Pacific Plate was mostly going to the west, and that's the period during the the still stand where the Pacific Plate was moving west and not didn't have much of a northward component. And then when the Kula Plate disappears and the Aleutian Arc forms, and then, then you start to get northward pole of the Pacific Plate. So now it starts, the pole starts to move again. And then in around 30 million years, you get the collision of the uh, Pacific uh, Farallon Ridge with North America, and that causes a change in Pacific Plate motion again. Now there's that sort of area in between that we really don't know about because we don't know at what time the western part of the Pacific Plate uh, became involved in subduction zones and would have picked up a strong slab, coal, slab pole component as you see in the middle diagram. Next slide. Okay. Now, here's one of the punchlines I wanted to get to. One of the very, very interesting things about our study was that still stand. During the period, remember, from 80 million years to about 49 million years by, those are just the average ages of the poles we're looking at. Uh, as you see in this diagram on the right, they're shown by uh, that cluster of poles just off of eastern Greenland. The magnetic pole didn't move, but if we predict what the paleomagnetic pole movement should be using the plate motion relative to the hot spots, we get paths that are shown by these sort of dotted, these dotted paths going down. There's a series of models there that show Pacific plate motion. I think the dots are every five million years. And what they show is that during that period, from during the period of the emperor seamount chain, from around 80 to around 48, 49, 47 million years, there should be significant northward motion. But the paleomagnetic poles don't say that. The paleomagnetic poles and say, say that within the resolution of the data, there was no northward motion. And that is a huge change, okay? And it says something very important. Next slide. Okay, so here's a couple different ways to look at that. The, the top diagram 
I wanted to show you a couple things. That's paleo latitude space because Tarduno came to talk to you about the latitude drift of the uh, of the emperor chain. And the purple triangles in the upper diagram are the paleo latitudes basically from his paper, his science paper. You see Detroit, you see 433, 1205, and 1206 are all in the emperor chain. And you see the paleo latitudes coming down to the present latitude of, of uh, Luihi, which is the dashed horizontal line. If we take the paleomagnetic poles from the polar wander path, what we see is the very same thing. The red circles are the predicted paleo latitude for Hawaii from those paleomagnetic poles. And of course, the error bars show the 95% confidence limits. And you see 80, 68, 61, 49 all follow the trend of the emperor paleomagnetic data. And they should because they include those same data, but they also include a lot of other data. So they say the rest of the Pacific plate agrees with that and shows this paleo latitude trend. Now notice at 49, the 49 pole, the 39 pole, and the 30 pole are all at the same latitude that agrees with the present day latitude of Loihi. Suggests that the paleo latitude, the hot spot, changed relatively rapidly, then stopped changing at the time of the bend, and hasn't really changed since. The bottom diagram is a little bit different way of looking at it. The bottom diagram shows the amount of northward movement of a plate. Uh, a point on the plate, and this point is be the Hawaiian hotspot. And you see the, the, the red squares are what is predicted by the paleomagnetic data. And importantly, the blue dashed line is what's predicted by, uh, actually that's Wessel and Kroenke's 1997 model, but it showed the same thing if you looked at their more, more recent model. And you see a large amount of northward motion there. Now, look at the agreement with the with the red uh, squares. You see there's good agreement for 30, for 39 and 40, almost perfect agreement. But at 61, 68 and 80, you see that the paleomagnetic data stop their northward movement, but the, the, the motion of the, the parent motion of the hotspot changes quite a bit over that amount of time, uh, as you see in the right part of that diagram. Now, in the bottom, you see uh, purple stars. That's what's predicted by that plate circuit model where you take the Indo-Atlantic hotspots, and you rotate them all around, all the way around the world. And you see something that sort of agrees with uh, the paleomagnetic data, but doesn't. Sort of agrees with the, with the hotspots, but doesn't. And then the yellow dashed line is what's predicted by the equatorial sediment facies. And that shows the very same uh, trend as the paleomagnetic data and the hotspot data for the Cenozoic, but it shows some sort of offset, which makes you wonder if there's an offset between the reference frames. Anyway, all, all things to think about. In general, we see that there is this northward drift of about 12 degrees or so since Eocene time, since the Hawaiian Emperor Bend, that all reference frames agree. But then the paleomagnetic data suggests no northward drift uh, before that time, but the emperor chain suggests a lot of northward south movement. Next slide. Okay, so let's look at that. Let's do a little cartoon vector diagram here and think about what does that mean exactly? Okay, so I'm just doing a very simple-minded vector diagram here that is, uh, has to do with the time of the, uh, of the emperor chain. So the emperor chain you see there on the left, it's that red arrow going north-south. And the V with the P and H means the velocity of the plate relative to the hotspot. So that's the same one, and then we move it down and stick it down near Hawaii on the right-hand side of the diagram. And all right, so the motion of the uh, hotspot relative to the mantle has to be some combination of the plate motion relative to the hotspot and the motion of the plate relative to the mantle. Now, we don't really know the motion of the plate relative to the mantle, but we can guess. Let's say that it's the same as the motion of the plate relative to the mantle today, which is the, em the Hawaiian chain shown by the purple arrow. Okay, so follow the purple arrow and say that's a diagram that represents plate motion relative to the mantle. If we take the vector sum, what you get is the yellow vector, which says that's the motion of the hotspot relative to the mantle. And the reason I do that is to say that what our paleomagnetic data suggests, if the motion of the, of the plate relative to the hotspot was the same as it was today, in other words, a large component of westward motion, that means that not only did the hotspot have a large southward component of motion, it also had to have 
almost an equally or maybe even greater uh, westward motion, all depending on the amount of westward motion. And if you want to think about why that is, think about this. The, the emperor chain is almost straight north and south. So if the hot spot, if the plate had any westward motion at all, the hot spot had to have a similar westward motion to keep up with it so that you have, in the end, a north-south uh, directed uh, motion as shown by the emperor chain. So this to me is a really interesting sort of uh, um, observation because the, the models of mantle flow all show more or less north-south motion towards the, the south, uh, the Pacific Antarctic rise. But this suggests almost going in the opposite direction. It also means that remember that at the Hawaiian Emperor Bend, the hot spot seems to have stopped moving. So what this suggests, or at least the northward component went away. So it suggests that this hot spot was whizzing to the southwest and suddenly slammed on the brakes at the time of the Hawaiian Emperor Bend. And I don't know about you, but I find that kind of be one of those things that kind of makes me shake my head and makes me wonder if I really know what hot spots are doing. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, as I see that I'm running low on time here, I'm going to, I think I'm going to skip over the next couple of slides a little bit or at least go through them very quickly. We try to explain, we can look at the, the offset between the paleomagnetic reference frame and the hotspot reference frame and try to interpret it a number of different ways. One of them is the moving hotspot, which I mentioned up until now. Another way to get a paleo latitude is to take the whole Earth and rotate it as a whole change the, in other words, change where the spin axis is relative to the whole Earth, and that's called true polar wander. And so I'll let you look at this diagram uh, at a different time, but basically the idea is that if the hot spots uh, are fixed in the mantle, but the mantle itself turns, we can get a paleo latitude change, but it needs to be consistent on all sides of the Earth. Next slide. Uh, basically, that's what this says. The left-hand diagram shows hot spots that are all moving and keeping the same relative uh, orientation and the magnetic vectors shown by the little circles over the seamounts change with time, but they do so in a systematic way that shows that the whole Earth rotated. Or you could have hot spots that are all moving relative to one another and uh, there's no true polar wander, or you can have a combination of all those things. Unfortunately, the bottom line is we don't have the data to tell us which of those is right. Next slide. Okay. Um, this diagram shows that if you backtrack the Pacific apparent polar wander path from 92 million years onward relative to the hot spots, what you get is an offset that's been interpreted by some as true polar wander. But as you see, the problem is that the, this, the paleomagnetic data and the motion data for the emperor chain don't match, and that's really what's driving your offset here. Next, next slide. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. If you look at, this is an attempt to look at data from all over the globe except for the Pacific and see if they have a similar sort of motion as the Pacific data. It's kind of equivocal. You do see motions that suggest that there could be true polar wander, but the jury's still out. Next slide. Trying to work towards my, okay, so I think I'm down to my conclusion slides here. So to me, the current picture is kind of confusing because there are lots of claims and counterclaims. I think most geoscientists still accept that plumes and hot spots are probably some large part of the volcanism we see. Although there's a strong anti-hotspot crowd, the consensus seems to be that there are probably a small number of primary plumes with many secondary plumes. I think the majority has given up on the fixed hotspot hypothesis, but fixed is a relative term now. For example, one of the things that Dr. Wessel's uh, um, model shows is that, at least in the Pacific Ocean, <coughs> all the hotspots sort of hang together in at least a mini reference frame. And that says something important about, about hotspots. Uh, I would also add that these mantle flow models that are very, um, that very much bias our thinking, they're widely accepted, but, not, but they're largely untested. Next slide. Okay. And anyway, so what the heck is up with the Hawaiian Emperor Bend? Like I said when I started my talk, I thought, and for many years have thought, that it showed a change in plate motion. But my data say that it probably didn't sh uh, show a change in plate motion. There is no need to change the plate motion at that time. The motion of the melting anomaly certainly seems to have changed, but there's no need to, the, the plate itself doesn't seem to have had a northward drift. There's only a small change, and that would fit with a lot of other things. 
But one of the things it does is it makes a hotspot that acts in a way that is kind of unhotspot like to me. Did the hotspot really race to the southwest and then slam on the brakes at 47 million years? Because true polar wander, the motion of the whole Earth can't cause the change in the, can't uh, cause the Hawaiian Emperor Bend. It has to be a change in the relative motion of the hotspot and the plate itself. And then I didn't really talk about that rapid polar shift just before the emperor chain is something for another talk at another time. So why don't you let me hang it up there? Uh, we've, I've run almost a total hour, but that'll give me a chance for a few questions.